This is your life, episode number three. This is your life. Are you who you wanna be? This is your life. Hello and welcome to this episode of This Is Your Life. My name is Michael Hyatt, and this is the podcast dedicated to intentional leadership. My goal is to help you live with more passion, work with greater focus, and lead with extraordinary influence. Today, we're going to be talking about the relationship between vision and productivity. And maybe you've never thought about this before, but they really are related. Um, If you don't have a vision, or if you aren't crystal clear on the vision you have, you're not going to be very productive. It's just hard to work and stay focused if you don't know what you're trying to accomplish. Simple common sense, right? Well, I've seen this play out in real life again and again. In fact, I have a a friend who's in this never-ending search to become more productive. He tries every new piece of software. He buys every new hardware gadget. And he's on this um, constant quest for just a little more productivity. But this isn't his problem, and it may not be yours either. The problem is that he lacks clear goals. It's that simple. He doesn't have a clear, crystal clear vision. The reason I know this is because I've seen how it operates in my own life. Let me just tell you a story. In July of 2000, my boss at Thomas Nelson suddenly resigned. Up until that point, I was like the assistant divisional manager of one of Thomas Nelson's 14 divisions. And I was asked to take his job when he resigned. And so I became the publisher or the general manager of Nelson Books, which was one of the publishing divisions of Thomas Nelson. And I I knew before I took the job that our division was in bad shape, but I just didn't know how bad it was until I became the publisher. So I um, took a deep breath and I began to assess what I found. We were the least profitable division of 14 in the company. We'd actually lost uh, money the previous year and people in other divisions were mumbling about our performance and how it had drugged the whole company's performance down. Revenue growth had been basically flat for three years. In addition, we just lost our single biggest author to a competing publishing company, and that made revenue revenue growth even that much more difficult thinking about the future. And in addition to that, we were publishing about 125 new titles a year with 10 people. Everyone is overworked and the quality of, uh, of our output showed it. We just, we just simply had more to do than we could possibly do. And so, you know, I could have at that point talked about productivity, uh, brought in some training about productivity, but it wouldn't have helped because the problem was our vision. So I began to assess the situation and I realized that things could not have been worse. But uh, frankly, as a new divisional executive, I realized that things couldn't have been better for me individually. Why? Because if I turned the division around, I would be a hero. If I didn't, that was okay too. I mean, after all, the division was a mess when I inherited it, so I, I really didn't have anything to lose. But I started by getting crystal clear on my vision. First thing I did was I went off on a private retreat. I had one objective in mind for that time alone. I wanted to get crystal clear in my vision. I asked, what do I want to see happen? What would the division look like in three years? I didn't care about the strategy. I didn't care about the division's productivity. I was only concerned about one thing, vision. And this is important because through the years, I've learned that if you think about strategy, the how, too early, it will actually inhibit your vision, the what, and it'll block you from thinking as big as you need to think. What you need is a vision that is so big that it is compelling, not only to other people, and you're going to have to recruit some other people to to accomplish the vision, but to you. If it's not compelling to you, you're not going to have the motivation to stay the course and you won't be able to recruit other people to help you. And you're not going to be productive in your day-to-day workflow. For example, if I'd been strategic before I was visionary, I might have said something like this. Well, I don't see how we can accomplish this much. The situation is so dire. We don't have enough resources. Let's just, you know, try to break even this year. Maybe we can reduce our working capital some by selling off a little obsolete inventory and maybe we can sign a few new authors and get a little revenue growth. But I would have been thinking too small. Well, do you think anyone would have gotten excited about that? 
No. Would this vision have attracted the right authors? I doubt it. Would it have retained the right employees? No. Would it have secured additional corporate resources? I don't think so. The problem is that people get stuck on the how. They don't see how they could accomplish more, so they throttle back their vision, convinced that they must be, quote, realistic. And what they expect becomes their new reality. And this is simply um, faith applied negatively. Well, I didn't take that approach. Instead, I developed a vision statement that I personally found compelling as the divisional leader. If I didn't get excited about it, how was I going to sell it to anybody else? Instead, I gave myself permission to envision the perfect future. And here's what I wrote down. I actually wrote down 10 components of this vision. And, and this all happened when I was on this private retreat. Here's what I said. I said, Nelson Books is the world's largest, most respected provider of inspirational books. And then I had this as the first item. We have 10 franchise authors whose new books sell at least 100,000 copies in the first 12 months. Notice a few things about that. It's very specific. It's very quantifiable. It's something I could vision. It was concrete. Number two, I said, we have 10 emerging authors whose new books sell at least 50,000 copies in the first 12 months. Number three, I said we're publishing 60 new titles a year. So essentially, I was going to cut our production in half, believing that if I did that, it would give us the focus and the productivity to make those 60 do better than the previous 125 that we were publishing. Number four, I said authors are soliciting other authors on our behalf because they are so excited to be working with us. You know, I envisioned kind of this um, army of evangelists, authors that had had such a positive working relationship with us that they went out voluntarily and recruited other authors to publish with us. Number five, I said the top agents routinely bring us their best authors and proposals because of our reputation for success. In the publishing business, um, literary agents are what make it happen. If you get them satisfied and they bring their authors to you, then they bring more authors to you. So I knew that agents were the key referral source that I had to satisfy. Number six, I said we place at least four books a year on the New York Times bestsellers list. Now, I mean, we were maybe getting one book a year on the, on the bestsellers list, but I thought, what would really energize us? What would make it easier to do what we need to do and to market our books? Well, if you hit the bestsellers list, a lot of good things really do happen. So that was a key ingredient of my vision going forward. Number seven, I said we consistently have more books on the Christian bestsellers list than our competitors. At the time, that wasn't the truth, but I envisioned this as part of the future that I wanted to help create. Number eight, I said we consistently exceed our budget in revenue and margin contribution. Now, in the corporate world, that's how we measured profit at the divisional level was something we called marginal contribution. But it was basically um, after our divisional overhead, what was the profit that was left that we could contribute back to the parent company? So I wanted to be in a position where we consistently, not just, you know, on a fluke every once in a while, but consistently exceeded our budget. Number nine, I said our employees consistently max out their bonus plans. Now, I know a lot goes into the work environment and to motivation and morale besides compensation. But I also know that when the compensation's right and when people are getting their bonuses on a regular basis, that's hugely motivating. Momentum begets momentum. Number 10, I said we are the fastest growing, most profitable division in our company. Now, again, I want to just remind you, at that point, we were 14th out of 14. We were dead last. In fact, I had told the CEO, who was my boss at the time, I said, this is going to take at least three years to turn around. And, and after he looked at the facts, he said, you know, I think you're right. Well, that wasn't the case. A lot of good things happened, as I'll, as I'll tell you in just a minute. So after this retreat where I wrote down these items, and they, they got more fine-tuned later, but uh, I went back with these 10 items. And once I had it on paper, I, I, I met with the entire staff. And I reviewed our current reality. I was brutally honest with where we were. The situation was dire, and I didn't pull any punches. I just told it like it was, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Well, then I shared the new reality, the vision, and I described it in as much detail as I could with as much enthusiasm as I could muster. And that wasn't hard because I found the vision compelling. It wasn't that hard to be compelling to other people. 
So I shared that with them and some were slow to get on board. Some were slow to believe. Uh, Some people uh, got right on board, but eventually everybody came around. Well, listen, I personally read through this vision daily. I prayed over every part. I asked God to guide us. I I knew I wasn't going to be able to do this on my own. But little by little, he brought us the strategy and the resources because we got clear on the what, the how showed up. And I spent way more time, maybe 10 to 1, focused on the what rather than the how. So when people would ask me uh, as we were going through these first months, how in the world are you going to accomplish this vision? I would just smile and say, you know, I'm not sure, but I'm I'm confident it's going to happen. Just watch. Well, guess what? It did happen. And it didn't take us 18 months like I told the CEO, or excuse me, three years. It took 18 months. We accomplished what I thought would take three years in just 18 months. And we exceeded almost every aspect of our our vision. And, And kind of the extraordinary thing in this story was that over the next six years, Nelson Books was consistently the fastest growing, most profitable division at Thomas Nelson. It had one bestseller after another. It was home to almost all of our company's best selling authors during that time. And it didn't happen because we had a great business strategy. It didn't happen because we decided to be more productive. It didn't happen because we had more resources in the other divisions. No, it happened because we had a clear vision of what we wanted to achieve. That's where we started and that's where you've got to start if you wanna experience a different reality than the one you have now. And if you wanna become more productive. Well, here's my premise in this podcast. You can develop your own vision by following these seven steps. Step number one, get alone with just a journal and a pen. Yeah, you could use your laptop, but uh, there's something about writing it out that frees me up from the distractions that come along with having my laptop open. And get away to a solitary place if you can. So much the better. I mean, even honestly, if it's only a public library, find a corner, you know, on the second or third story of the public library building and go back there and work where you're not going to be distracted. You're not going to be bothered and you can focus. So step number one, get alone with just a journal and a pen. Step number two, make sure you won't be interrupted. Turn off your cell phone, your email if you're using a laptop, television, you know, anything that threatens to distract you because, again, you want to get very focused. This is some of the most serious work that you'll ever do as a leader, and that's getting clear on the future. And by the way, that doesn't just come naturally for me. You know, it's not just like, you know, I close my eyes and boom, you know, I see the future in in, uh, full color and I've got great clarity. No, I have to start, uh, I have to fight for every one of these components. I have to fight for clarity and it's really easy to leave it fuzzy, but I can't be distracted and be productive. So step number two is make sure you won't be interrupted. Step number three, close your eyes and pray. Now, I don't know if you believe in God or not. But I'm just telling you, if you want to accomplish big things in life, it really helps to get some divine inspiration and some guidance. What you ultimately want is alignment between his plan and your vision. But don't make this harder than it needs to be. I mean, people get all, you know, twisted up in this thinking, oh my gosh, you know, if I want it, then God must not want it. You know, I I think that's a bunch of baloney. I think usually God speaks through our desires. And I don't have time to develop it in this podcast. If that's a new thought, then read John Eldridge's book, Desire, The Journey We Must Take to Find the Life God Offers. And I've got a link in the show notes if you want to go uh, back to it later at michaelhyatt.com. Step four. Write down your current reality. This is where I would start. Write down with your your current reality. Describe all the things that you don't like about this area in which you're trying to get a vision. Be brutally honest. Don't pull any punches. It's difficult to change unless you find your current reality unacceptable. You know, if it's kind of comfortable and it's not that bad, you might just stay stuck in it. But you've got to find the stuff that you don't like so that you've got the motivation you need to change. Step number five, now write down what you would like to see happen. This to me is the most fun part. This is the creative part. This is where you begin to paint the picture. Write it down in detail and you've got to write it down. There is something about writing 
um, down your vision that brings clarity. Somebody once said, thoughts disentangle themselves, passing over the lips and through pencil tips. And I think that's true. You know, whether you talk about it or whether you write it, both of those help. But of the two, writing it down is a huge help in making it happen. And, and I would write it down in the present tense. This is really important. Write it down in the present tense, like I did in the example above, as though it's already happened. This makes it more real to you, more believable, more concrete. Step number six, share your vision with the people who have a stake in the outcome. Now, I want to talk just a minute about this. I know there are people out there who think, you know, you should share your vision broadly, like, you know, tell the world. And frankly, I used to believe that and I used to teach it. So, for example, when I decided I was going to run my first half marathon, I blogged about it and told the whole, whole world what I was going to do. Now, it worked a little bit for me because it gave me some leverage because now all of a sudden I was publicly exposed. If I didn't run this half marathon, it was going to be very embarrassing because I told the world I was going to do it. But here's the problem with that. There's been some additional research that shows that a lot of people get the same psychological satisfaction from talking about the vision as if they had actually accomplished the vision. And sometimes people quit on their vision because they get that psychological satisfaction. So I don't anymore, I don't tell everybody my goals. I don't go public with my goals. I tell the people that uh, have a stake in the outcome and can help me get to where I want to go in the destination or in the vision. So I'm very selective about that. And I hold the rest of it to myself because I don't want, frankly, that sense of psychological satisfaction at the beginning. I want a sense that I'm still working to achieve this dream in the future. Step number seven, commit to reading your vision daily. Commit to reading your vision daily. This also is critically important. Um, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1 says, Faith is the evidence of things not seen. Well, look, the more you can see this, the more likely it will come to pass. And the thing that I, that I found is that daily when I review the vision, I think of things that I can do that day to inch toward the vision. In most cases, for me, accomplishing a vision is not something that happened with some massive action. It was usually something that happened incrementally, day by day, as I just took one action and then the next action. And I'll tell you, there are a lot of times that I couldn't see the whole path. I couldn't see how it was going to get there from here. But I could see the next few steps that I needed to take in that direction. And so I would take those. But reviewing the vision daily gives you the opportunity to connect with it daily. And, and here's the key, to let that vision drive your daily behavior and to populate your to-do list with things that move you toward the, the vision, not just these things that are, uh, that are uh, urgent, but not important. And we just want to avoid the tyranny of the urgent. So let me just say in, in conclusion, Again, I think that vision is more important than strategy. Vision is the key to productivity because once you get clear on the vision and you understand why it's important to you, you're going to find ways of being productive. You're going to have the energy to move toward it, but not until you get that clarity. So if you find yourself mired in un unproductive behavior, I would say you don't need a new gadget. You don't need some new software, though a lot of people uh, go on a quest for that. But I'd say instead, get back in touch with your vision. Okay, I want to leave you with one question today. And the question is this. What have you been focusing on? Productivity or vision? Strategy or vision? Where has your focus been? And to comment on this episode, go to my blog at michaelhyatt.com. And there's a comment section below the show notes right there where you can leave your comments, leave your questions. I had several uh, questions that came in by email in preparing for this session. I've been announcing this on Twitter, what I was going to podcast about, and then asking people to submit their questions. So I got this one question from John. So John wrote in and he said this, Hi Michael, how does one go about rebuilding a vision that has been lost? I'm not sure if this is the kind of question you were looking for, but I figured I'd throw it out there, as I'm sure there are many of us out there who have lost sight of our vision due to a loss of a business or a job. Yeah, I tell you what, um, 
Vision is usually the first casualty, and it can happen through any kind of setback, any kind of challenge that we encounter or obstacle that we account, encounter along the way. We get so focused on the current problem that we forget what it was we were trying to create or the destination to which we were headed. So I just think that when that happens, you've got to go back to the vision, and it's not easy. You may not have the energy. You may say, you know, gee, I just, um, I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm, I, I don't think I can do it anymore. Or I, I don't know if I have what it takes. Go back to the vision. This takes discipline. Uh, it takes discipline when you're discouraged. It takes discipline when you're down. But it's what you must do. Without a vision, the people perish. That's why it's so essential. It's, it's like the fuel that drives your day-to-day workflow. And if you don't have it, you're going to get stuck, no doubt. Then I got a letter uh, or an email also from Jim, and he said, what are some helpful strategies for communicating vision through social media and blogs? Bit by bit, all at once, how often, what social media outlets do you recommend? What about leaders who are anti-social media? How do you reach people who don't do the internet? Well, I'm not sure, maybe we just don't have the same understanding um, on this, John, about what the vision is. And hopefully from the the preceding podcast, you've got a a sense of what I believe about vision, but I don't think this is something you share broadly. It's not something you're gonna broadcast um, on social media. Now, you may broadcast your mission statement as an organization, or some of the things that you're doing as an organization, but I would not hang out there what you in, intend to do. You don't build a reputation on what you intend to do. You build a re- reputation on what you've done. Notice how Apple, you know, which is one of my favorite companies to reference, they don't really tell you very much about what's coming. A lot gets leaked, but they don't tell you what's coming. Instead, they wait till you show up at one of their conferences and then they show you what they've already created. And they don't show you some theoretical thing, but this is actually the product. And many times the product is ready to ship when they show you. And that's what creates a wow experience. It's that gap between what you expect when you go in with to what you actually experience when you see the product or the service. And I think you want to keep that gap. So I wouldn't tell people what you intend to do. I would only tell them what you've done. And again, uh, back to sort of a need to know basis, share vision with people that are part of your team and part of the team that can help you get to the vision. But I wouldn't share it more uh, broadly than that. Dennis wrote to me and he said, hi, Michael, greetings from the Ukraine. Who knew I had listeners in the Ukraine? But thank you for the chance to ask you this. So super helpful. My question about vision is this. When you make a decision about your personal vision for your life, how do you know that your values will not change during your reaching of the vision? 15 years ago, I had one vision. Now it's different because I realized with time that my values 15 years ago weren't really settled. Some of them weren't mine at all. Now thinking about vision for my life, I have to know what I'm really longing for. Thank you. Looking forward to your podcast, Dennis. Dennis, that's a great question. And let me just say that your values, hopefully they won't change too much over time, but they probably can get more fine-tuned. You get more clarity about your values. But your vision is not something static. You know, this is not something that you go off on a retreat, you write down your vision, you know, you file it away, and you never revise it. No, in my view, a a vision is something that you're constantly updating. It's kind of like life planning. And I talk about this in my free life planning uh, workbook, Creating Your Personal Life Plan. But I talk about the importance of the weekly review and the quarterly review and even an annual review. And I use these as opportunities to revisit the vision and ask myself the question, has anything changed? Do I need to update any aspect of this vision. So if your values have shifted or if you have greater clarity about your values, you can also also shift the vision at that time. These are all living documents, whether they're our core values or our vision statement or our life plan or whatever it is, these are all living documents that can be tweaked and adjusted as necessary. Tyler wrote in and he said, hi, Michael. I had the pleasure of seeing you at Catalyst in Atlanta back in October. You answered a question of mine regarding selecting your clients wisely. It has helped me these past few months, so thanks for your wisdom. To your vision question, how important is vision when providing employee or volunteer correction and or punishment? Tyler. Well, the short answer is it's critically important. I try to cast everything in the context of what we're trying to create as articulated by the vision. So I had an employee one time who um, was really engaging in some behavior that frankly was contrary the culture, to the culture that we were trying to create. 
And so every time I would correct him, every time I sat down with him and, and would just challenge him on it, I would just say, look, this is the vision. This is where we're going. This is the kind of culture that we're trying to create and that we all said we're committed to trying to create. Your behavior is at odds with that vision and we can't tolerate it. And unfortunately for this guy, I ended up letting him go because he just wouldn't change. And I have this fundamental belief that the behavior of leaders are what, that's what creates culture in any organization. And sort of the corollary to that is if you want to change a culture, you have to change the behavior of the leadership team. And if you don't change the leader's behavior, you're not going to change the culture. So the guy just had to go. Bottom line was he just didn't make it. Well, that's it for this episode of This Is Your Life. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe to it at michaelhyatt.com forward slash this is your life, all one word, forward slash this is your life. That way you won't miss a single episode. You can also find more resources on my blog at michaelhyatt.com. And if you want to catch one of my live presentations, check out my speaking page at michaelhyatt.com forward slash speaking. Until next time, remember, your life is is a gift. Now go make it count. This is your life. Are you who you want to be? This is your life. Are you who you